Who's heard of the Fife Diet before today? Quite a lot of people, so uh, I won't spend a lot of time on it, but um, we've been going since 2007 uh, when a very small group of us decided to eat food only from the region, region we lived in for a year to see what that was going to be like. And um, we did a project in uh, Dundee in a school very early on and uh, we told the school pupils about the project and uh, asked them, uh, what do you think that's going to be like? What do you think is going to happen? And a, a boy at the back of the hall put his hand up and I said, yeah. He said, I think you're going to die. <laughs> and I think what he meant was, there's no food from where we live. We don't grow any food in Scotland. We don't grow any food in Fife. We certainly don't grow any taste in Tayside. And um, he was wrong, but it was an interesting example of how we're completely divorced from the land and our own food culture. And it's extraordinary the extent to which that's true. We did another session in our school and uh, we asked the children what kind of food they liked. And uh, they looked a bit confused for a while and they got together and quickly split into two groups. And one group of kids put their hand up and said, we like Asda food. <laughs> and the other group of kids put their hand up and said, we like Tesco food. <laughs> so there's an extraordinary corporate takeover of our own understanding of what food is. And so we see the Fife Diet as Occupy Food. And I think one of the developments that's been happening in the Occupy movement is this sense of it not being location-based, it being concept or community-based. I think that's an interesting idea. But what I'm going to talk about very briefly just now is a manifesto to ask there to be legislation to back some of this direct action and grassroots movement. And it is quite challenging for those of us who are anarchists or direct action people or to think about how we want to affect change and how Occupy works in that range of activities. So I'm going to just talk a little bit about some of the ideas to demand legislative change and for us to think about that, and that can be quite challenging. So next slide, please. Uh, yep, next slide as well, because that's just a bit about that. Um, so I suppose this is really driven by carbon because we're faced with the biggest challenge of our generation and arguably of our species. And uh, we know some basic things about food and carbon. We know that 30% of our carbon emissions come from the way we do our food at the moment. We also know, for example, that the Scottish Government's climate change targets ask for a 42% reduction by 2020 and an 80% reduction by 2050. So that's a huge ambition tar ambitious target and it's absolutely fantastic. The problem is that nobody, none of our political leaders have a clue how to do that. They don't have a clue. So if you think of 30% of our emissions coming from food and 42% reduction by 2020, that's less than a decade away. That's a huge shift if we're going to be anywhere near meeting those targets. So there's a real challenge about how we do food and carbon. Next slide, please. Uh, yeah, the way we do this does make an impact. We ask people to do five or six things. We ask them to eat more locally, but we ask them to eat more organic, reduce their food waste, compost more, grow some of their own food. Um, and we crash our carbon impact by doing those things. Next slide, please. Next one, please. Uh, okay, so we've got a network of people. We've grown from 14 people who started it to over 3,000, so we're now the largest local food project in Europe, and we're trying to double that in the next couple of years. Next slide, please. So uh, what we've done is we've built this mass movement, uh, and now we're demanding some change to support this because it can't happen on, on its own. And our aims are three things. We want to connect the way we grow, produce, distribute, and consume our food with our climate change targets. So we're saying that every year, we need to be reducing our emissions from food, year on, year on. This is what countries like Denmark do, for example. They have uh, uh, immediate goals and medium-term goals and long-term goals. We need to connect our environmental policy to our health and well-being initiatives because at the moment they just operate as if what you eat and how, what your health is are disconnected. And funnily enough, they are connected. And thirdly, we need to look afresh at the values that underpin how we organise our food economy. So since the financial crisis, the financial collapse, we've had the whole Occupy movement and we've had people beginning to raise the wider issues of our values. But in our government, in our country, at the moment, how we evaluate if our food is any good is basically how much salmon we're exporting to China, 
how much growth is in the economy, and that's all about exports. It's the only indicator they're really interested in. So part of the manifesto is to challenge that and say there need to be some other indicators. Next slide, please. So uh, we've, we've thrown out there 20 ideas to change the way we eat, to change the food system. And we've published uh, on fifediet.co.uk um, in some detail 10 of those ideas. And then we'll be publishing in a few weeks in more detail the next 10. So the first of the food manifesto is the soup test. And that is the idea that no child should leave school in Scotland without being able to make a pot of soup. It's really simple stuff. The best ideas are often really simple. This is just about skilling people up to be able to take charge of their own lives, look after themselves in affordable way. Uh, this is easily done. This doesn't need any legislation. We can do it through the Eco Schools Network that currently exists. We've got mass support for this. And I think there is a strategic issue here about some ideas being nice and fluffy and everybody loving them and other ones being a bit tougher. So everybody likes the soup test, so that's good. The second is a bit more difficult. In the 80s, we were obsessed with this idea of the right to buy, the right to buy our own houses. And what we want to propose is the right to grow, the right to access to land to grow some of your own food. The current legislation for allotments is inadequate and doesn't mean that people get that right. So we can strengthen that through some legislation that's going through the Scottish Parliament at the moment. The third idea is a seasonal five a day. At the moment, we all know that you're supposed to eat five portions of fruit and veg a day. Most of us eat two, sometimes three. We know that this has a massive impact on cancer rates and wider health. And so what we're talking about is bringing together the environmental message, the ecological imperative with the health and well-being ideas. And these not being in silos, but being brought together. The fourth idea is a soda tax where we put a small uh, amount of, of tax on the worst fizzy soft drinks that are rotting kids' teeth, causing obesity and making massive profits. It doesn't really have to be a big deal, but what we'd imagine doing is what you call hypothecated tax. So that tax comes back into community food projects and other things to create some revenue stream. Uh, the fifth thing we want to do is to elevate food to the climate change agenda. So we need to have some carbon uh, calculations of what the reductions and changes we're making are year on year. The sixth idea we have is a halt on any further supermarket developments. At the moment, every other day in Britain, a new supermarket is opened. It's an extraordinary saturation of uh, the retail world and it's, it's accelerating. So what we want to do, and this is within the powers of the current Scottish Government, um, although th there's some argument about um, the monopolies issue here, which might require uh, full independence, but this is something that could be legislated through planning now. The seventh idea is that we want to decentralise our food infrastructure. We need to have methods where you can have mills and abattoirs and dairies that are decentralised to different scales so that you can have regional food economies. This can't happen on its own, it needs to be coordinated. The eighth idea is blasta, which is the Gallic word for taste or flavour. And uh, last year we started uh, Scotland's local food feast where uh, in over 30 communities throughout the country, uh, people held their own food celebrations. And this is about food sovereignty, the idea that um, it comes from the Via Campesina movement that um, a country's first responsibility should be to feed its own people, not to export. So the idea of food sovereignty is a very powerful one in developing countries, but it can be more powerful here, that we don't obsess with exporting uh, salmon to China, we obsess with creating good, fresh, unprocessed foods for our own people. Uh, ninth uh, is just we need, a, we need to have a food leadership team, we need to have some collective responsibility for that. This can't be top-down policy, it needs to be shared. The tenth idea is that we need sustainable public procurement where our hospitals, our schools, our large-scale institutions draw on the regions around them to sustain them. Uh, all of this is e easily attainable. Next slide, please. 
So uh, there's lots of ideas in here, and I'd really like you to go onto the website, read them in detail, and respond to them, give your feedback. What we're going to be doing over the next few months is holding these ideas up to scrutiny, seeing which ones have real value and strength and which ones don't, critiquing them, getting people's input, having a number of live forums where people who are interested in food or have got some uh, responsibilities there uh, come and take part. Um, we, we think we've got some really good ideas and we've got some real lines to take them uh, to make them happen, but we want your input. Um, I'm going to be talking a bit later about how directly I see the Fife Diet and the local food movement being part of the Occupy movement when we go to the live thing and I talk to the entire world, apparently, which is going to be great. <laughs> I'm really looking forward to that. Um, but thank you very much for listening. And if you've got any questions or points, I'd really like to hear them. Thank you. Um, back in the late 90s, uh, I used to help run a company called EcoWorks Nottingham Limited. Still going today, thankfully. It's worth a look. Uh, we liaised with the Robin Hood Chase Centre in St Anne's, which is a really run-down neighbourhood of Nottingham, race riots, a very high crime rate, etc, etc. Uh, the first thing, the point about the allotments, well, allotments are being sold off at a rate of knots and being developed. Um, so we're losing that as a resource. So our response to this was to take on as many allotments as we could and then grow, you know, organic food, forest gardening, permaculture, tie that in with wind power projects, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, arts and crafts using recycled stuff. Um, now, we liaised with the local community centre and any surplus we had from the allotments, of which obviously everyone took a share, went to the local community. So they could provide subsidised meals, again, et cetera, et cetera. You can use your imagination. Um, we did actually try and engage with the council on an initiative to, prant, uh, to plant fruit trees and nuts and, and things like this and were actively stopped. They wouldn't have any of it. They didn't want us planting anything that was fruit bearing other than in our own little area, which I think is a problem that needs addressing. Um, because if we could do this obviously in areas where it's not a major public highway so the stuff's getting polluted, um, then again, you know, we, we're looking directly here at uh, people who are going hung hungry who've got direct, ac direct access uh, to food. And if, if it's planned properly, um, I really like your initiatives, by the way, if it's planned properly, then there's no reason why anyone should go hungry at all um, in this country. They can simply pick, forage, and then maybe supplement with um, some educational programs around about the wild food that is springing up everywhere at the moment. And uh, I just stick that on the back of what you said there and wish you the very best of luck and uh, I'd like to talk to you afterwards if that's it. For those of us at the banking conference last Friday, we heard from Oxfam saying that uh, the speculative market of uh, the food futures market basically has risen from 12% up to 61%. And that's actually driving up food prices. Given the vested interest of the financial sector in now food sector and relating to what the gentleman just said, do you think that there's going to be more... Uh, restrictions on people being able to grow local food because that actually circumvents the financial sector and that speculative market and do you think that's going to get worse as the economy gets worse because they're going to want to control the entire food market um no i don't really think that's going to happen i think there are drivers driving up food prices but i don't think the system is coherent enough or clever enough to do what you describe in fact, I think what's happening is that the local food movement is really strong and really powerful and has got stronger in recession um, because people's major um, incentive for supporting local food isn't climate change. It's that they want to know where their food comes from and they want to support local producers. In fact, if you see in, in Scotland, there has been an increase in allotments and access to land. It's just not happening nearly fast enough. So although some allotments have been and are being sold off, uh, there's a huge expansion of uh, the right to grow. And we need to seize that, take hold of that, and enshrine that in law and make it happen at a much bigger scale. And probably talk about uh, urban agriculture in the sort of scale that you saw in Havana and elsewhere. And I'm much more interested in that large scale type of operation. I think if we start talking about a population of 5 million people foraging for food, I'm not sure how credible that is really. It's sure wild food should be part of our culture and should be part of our knowledge base, but it's not going to sustain people, in my opinion. Um, so 
Yep, absolutely. Uh, hedge funds and uh, food speculation is a major issue, but I don't think it's coordinated enough to say, ah, and we're going to cleverly stop you getting access to land. I don't believe that's the case.